pulsars, this particular sort of stellar um, phenomena that we see, you have, a t uh, you have an idea about them and what they are. Uh, let, let's talk really quickly about what that idea is um, and go from there. Okay. Uh, I believe pulsars are artificial beacons. They're of extraterrestrial intelligence origin. And uh, you conclude that from a number of things. First, they're the most complex phenomenon known to astronomers. Uh, they, they humble astronomers. <laughs> they're, they're so complex. In fact, the, the, the people that are working on them admit you actually will, I have in my book quoted some passages where they admit that there is no real theory that they can come up with to explain what they're seeing. Mm. Um, and you and can think of uh, complex computers out there spitting out information that's close to the idea. Uh, I spend uh, I have a whole chapter where I talk about the complexity of the signals. First of all, it's the most, okay, for example, we do see pulsating phenomena out there, like pulsating stars, but these are rather erratic, like if you study the period of the star, it's going to vary over time. Pulsars, if you study that, um, they are highly precise to 15 decimal places or more. Uh, and their their uh, profile. What are they? Okay, so the question is, what are they? They're um, what we see are broadband radio signals. They, they they're not discrete signals like TV stations. They they spread this over the whole spectrum. We pick them up with radio telescopes. So no matter what frequency our telescope was tuned to, it would see these, uh, which is convenient. That that's one thing you'd want to do if you were sending out signals and you wanted to, your source to be seen. Um, now, uh, <clears throat> they, uh, they accumulate many pulses to build up what's called a pulse profile. So if astronomers plot the pulsar's profile, in other words, how the Radio intensity varies with time because, okay, first of all, the period of these things can go from just a little over one thousandth of a second up to eleven seconds. Which, which means they're spinning very, very fast. Well, that's the standard model. That there's a star spinning that causes this pulsation. Ah, okay. So this is the lighthouse model. That we're that's the lighthouse model that was proposed. Actually, when they first discovered the first pulsar, they thought they discovered extraterrestrial communication. Right. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it sort of meets uh, it sort of meets all the criteria, as you said earlier, about what we would look for, or what we would expect. Uh, to find if we were looking for something that was artificial, it has all of those signals, but then it just sort of got, as always, it's sort of like, uh, be careful what you wish for, and then uh, yeah. then the paradigm kicks in and says, oh my gosh, we can't accept that particular possibility, now we have to try to explain it away. Well, already, uh, this occurred in the, the 60s, already there was the program to discredit UFO observers and so on. So scientists were very hesitant to come out and say they discovered something like this that was uh, of extraterrestrial origin. Right. And then they found uh, three, three more, and then uh, these were in different parts of the galaxy. So at that time, they thought it unlikely that one civilization would be broadcasting from so many places. They never thought the idea of a galactic civilization, a, a community, let's say galactic community. Right, with sort of a communications uh, network or something like that. Right. And so somebody suggested this lighthouse model. Mm. Uh, and originally they had the idea of a pulsating star, radially pulsating. Uh, but then that couldn't explain what they were seeing. But then they came up with the idea of a neutron star that would, would be spinning, causing it. Mm. And I show in the book uh, reasons why that has difficulty. Yeah, just to... to uh uh, to make it short, it's a it's a way over super simplification. Right. Uh, there is they are 
people, if, if you're interested in, in the details, get uh, uh, Talk of the Galaxy, and it's available at etheric.com and at 1-800, uh, let's see, what's that number? 715. 715-9993. Um, but, okay, so, so, the, so the pulsar is a very, very strange bird up there. So the question is, what is it if it's not a spinning neutron star? Okay, what, what your idea is? What I'm proposing is there is a neutron star there that's radiating cosmic rays, or in some cases it might be a white dwarf uh, or a uh, X-ray star. The point thing is it's a, a source of cosmic rays, cosmic ray electrons. And what the civilization has done is project a force field disk to the surface of the star and energize the disk so that it uh, decelerates the cosmic rays that come off the star. And what that does is it causes them to radiate radio emission mm. called synchrotron radiation. Synchrotron radiation. And that would be beamed, would form a beam. So in other words, these beams, there are beams, but they're not spinning, they're stationary beams. And the ones that we're seeing, the pulsars we see, uh, are beams that are directed towards us, towards our part of the uh, galaxy. Hmm. And they are flashed on and off. Uh, they are um, modulated uh, electronically. And uh, with the proper electronics, they can create these very complex patterns. Um, if you think of a TV picture being built up from scans, from the scans across the screen, mm -hmm. that sort of describes what a pulsar is. Mm. Uh, the profile, that's the very constant part of the pulsar, is built up from hundreds or thousands of individual pulses, pulses that are received. Right. The pulses themselves vary around, uh, but the, the, the overall picture is very constant. Uh, you can't explain that with a spinning neutron star. Mm. It, it, that is an indication of intelligence when you get that type of thing happening. And uh, and and from from my reading, it appears that the closer you look at these things, the more deeply embedded the the order seems to be. When I saw these two supernova remnants were marked in such unusual fashion with these flashing beacons. One is the brightest pulsar in the sky. That's the, uh, the uh, let's see, either the villa or the crab. Um, it's the fella brightest. And the crab pulsar is the most luminous of all. Right, right. And for those, I call them the king and queen of the pulsars, to be marking these two supernova so, remnants, it really calls your attention. And uh, that's what got me to look at their dates of their explosions and realize, hey, these were sequentially triggered by a, an event that moved at the speed of light away from the galactic center. And that's when I realized it was, a, it was this uh, cosmic ray front with possible gravity wave component. Right, and there's uh, even imagery that shows the bow shock of it uh, moving through those, uh, one, of, one of those nebula, at least. Yeah. Right, so so there are there are lots and lots of reasons why these things are really uh, extraordinary. Yeah, now, and I detail this in the book. Yes, but yes. the the um, to really uh, takes a lot of careful reading to piece all these things together. But the part that's the, probably the most convincing and easiest to understand is the locations of mm -hmm. certain of these pulsars, the most unusual, are located in key spots in the sky. The, the, the galactic core, the last time it exploded was, what, what's your best guess? Uh, well, the small explosion the small was about 700 years ago. And there was small a... outburst or burp or whatever you want to call it. Right. And uh, a major, the last major one was between 11,000 and 16,000 years ago. Okay. All right. Well, we'll... Uh, Keep our eyes on the skies. And I'll be back next week with John Major Jenkins. We'll talk about the Mayan calendar and what might be coming up in the year 2012.